So we'd just like to welcome General Vincent Brooks uh, to the podium. Uh, it is quite a remarkable testimony, I think, to the closeness and the value of the US-Australia relationship that we had your uh, deputy um, understudying you, General, uh, uh, in making a presentation uh, before your, your speech now. Uh, because, of course, before the Deputy Chief of Army was uh, in his current role, he was Deputy Commanding General, US Army Pacific. Now, General Brooks is uh, Commanding General of the US Army Pacific, a, a role that he uh, took on uh, on the 2nd of July 2013. Uh, if you refer to his bio in our program book, you will see that he's had a, a long uh, and distinguished career of uh, command and staff positions uh, in many of the regions of uh, theatres of conflict over the last uh, 15 or 20 years, and indeed in, in Washington as well. Uh, there's one thing I did want to say, uh, uh, General, which was to thank you for uh, your leadership and your support of my own uh, little institute, uh, ASPE, uh, for the decision that uh, General Brooks took some years ago to make it possible for uh, a member of uh, US Army Pacific to become a regular visiting fellow at the, um, at the institute. We, we had the first of those visiting fellows uh, stay with us for six months. Uh, over the, the end of last year and, and the beginning of this. And I think it is certainly something which is going to enhance the level of understanding which exists between uh, US Army Pacific and the Australian Defence Organisation as a whole. So thank you very much for that support, General. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, can I please ask you to welcome General Brooks to the podium. This is a, a, a wonderful occasion and a, a great privilege to be part of this dialogue, and I certainly appreciate that. My great thanks to ASPE for always pulling together uh, distinguished people with great ideas and doing something with it. And so, Chairman Loosely and my good friend Peter Jennings, thanks so much for this, this great privilege. I bring you greetings and aloha from uh, U.S. Pacific Command, which, of which I'm a part as their Army Component Command and Land Component Commander. And uh, our greeting, of course, is aloha. I can give you a good day as well if, you, if you'd like to do that. Rick Burr taught me how to say that. I'm still working on it. And we, uh, we hope that he came back saying y'all a few times. But uh, it really is a, a great honor to be with you. And I know that we have a lot of presentations to do, and uh, certainly not the least of which is to hear from your Prime Minister today. So I, I won't take a long period of time, but I do want to share some perspectives with you. Uh, let me just first say how important this work is that, that ASPE does all the time and uh, is doing. Uh, as, as Peter talked about, we did commit one of our first doctoral graduates from a program that's just recently been developed within the United States Army. The first graduate is the one that we sent here to ASPE. As uh, Peter offered us a tremendous opportunity for that officer to add depth and scope to the education that he received prior to coming. And by inserting him in ASPE as a fellow, I can tell you that he is uh, much better prepared now for his duties as a strategic advisor at US Pacific Command, which is where he's now posted. So Peter, thanks so much for taking good care of uh, Colonel Gleiman as he was down here. And uh, we certainly uh, hope that we're gonna benefit greatly from his experience down here as well. Uh, I. I really appreciate that ASPE is focused on the Australian Army in this conference. I think that's so important. And I'll talk about some of the reasons why you've heard that already this morning, how important it is, uh, an essential part of your jointed team. And if you are not paying attention to it, it will slip away from you. And we certainly see that as we have discussions about structures of armies around the world, including the United States Army. But in this case, so much of your national history is tied to your army. And so now is the right time to think about the future of the Australian Army. Now is the right time to have these modernizations, uh, modernization discussions, these organizational discussions, and to come to some conclusions. And I suspect that this will be very timely as well for Angus Campbell. I again congratulate you, Angus, on becoming Chief of Army. I really appreciated your remarks this morning. We are absolutely uh, thinking in the same, uh, same line 
on what is needed and uh, what can be done, but uh, I do hope that this will be very timely for you also, and congratulations once again. It's pretty clear to me as we survey the environment that things are moving quickly in Australia's view of Australia's defense postures and requirements, very, very quickly. And so whether it's the, uh, the first principles review uh, that has some very ambitious objectives, but also very clear direction and purpose as to the way things are going to be done in Australia defense, or the, the hard work of producing what's been ongoing for a while, the defense white paper, and we've had the, the privilege of providing some thoughts and commentary on that as it's being developed, but I, I know that that's coming to a close with high anticipation of a strategy that is tied to resources and how important that is. It may be a pretty unique document around the world once it comes out. But uh, we certainly uh, are keen to see what it says and uh, to find places of opportunity and maybe to glean some insights from that as well, from that entire approach of a strategy that is connected to resources without the resources constraining the thinking, which I think is uh, so impressive in this work that's being done. And of course, we've talked uh, about Plan Beersheba and how important that is and has been for the Australian Army. Uh, nearly complete. I, I know that the, the view is it's complete, but there's some follow-throughs and some vulnerabilities, as uh, Dr. Blaxlin talked about. And I do hope that you'll follow through on all three of these initiatives. So the first principle is the white paper and what is required to complete Beersheba, because they're all steps in the right direction, in my view. There's no doubt that we have a close relationship. The Australia-United States relationship is a, a famous relationship, but it's certainly a living relationship, a very important relationship, forged in battle over many years. You know the history so well, and I, I won't recount all of that, uh, but it is very important to us, and especially because Australia is such a reliable partner. I think that's very important. It's more than just having a, an alliance. It's a reliable partner, and that makes a big difference. Uh, when hard work has to be done, we need only look to our left or right, and we'll find that Australia is there. You're there time and time again, and history has said that for decades, that when hard work has to be done, you'll be there and you'll be counted. And we appreciate very much that even in the present day, you're doing hard work as regards combating violent extremists in Iraq and Syria. Important work that affects this region and affects the world as well. So thanks for being the ally, the partner that we can always count on. We really appreciate that. Now, I have to also mention the, uh, the, the great benefit of having an Australian Major General assigned as my Deputy Commanding General at U.S. Army Pacific. I did inherit that and it was a tremendous inheritance. As Rick Byrd had already been in place for, I guess, six, six or seven months or so when I took command. And I think that that was such a tremendous decision that was, that was taken by our two countries. A fast-track decision, to be sure. We sorted it out as we, as we got in there. But the impact that Rick had, and it, the impact that continues now with Greg Bilton, is significant in uh, ways that we did not foresee. Uh, for example, I, I just love to tell the story of whenever Rick is representing U.S. Army Pacific going into an international engagement in another country as the representative for U.S. Army Pacific, people just couldn't figure that out. So how is it that you're an Australian represent, representing U.S. Army Pacific? And it opened the door immediately and tangibly to the nature of the relationship between our two countries. And so it's been tremendous. It's been strategic. I would say also that by committing him and now Greg Bilton to the northern half of the Pacific Command area of responsibility, it is also creating foundational relationships that Rick and later Greg will bring back to Australia, relationships with countries in the northern half of the region, Japan, Korea, Mongolia, Nepal, India, etc. as we work across the top. So uh, we really appreciate that commitment. And it is, it is making a difference for us, to be sure, as we do our work. Now, I've been asked to provide a perspective on, for at least from the Allies' view, of the challenges that face armies. And I'll broaden that to say land forces, because I do think that that is the case. And certainly within U.S. Pacific Command, we look at land forces, U.S. Army Pacific, Marine Forces Pacific, and Special Operations Command Pacific. 
And the challenges it faces are similar in many manners. Uh, we also each bring unique capabilities to the joint team. And so I'll share some perspectives uh, by just laying out uh, a few quick thoughts on the challenges and then maybe rolling it up with one example of how we can contend with those challenges as, uh, as Rick opened the door to me. I, I would say that what we are after, in my estimation, for the United States Army and for the Australian Army is about the same thing. And I, 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 I characterize it as to be sufficiently sized with a modernized force structure that permits building readiness, meeting ongoing mission requirements, responding further to unforeseen requirements, and as a force that is ready to win in a complex world. I think we're after the same thing there, but there are challenges facing us. First, there are challenges in the way that armies are viewed. There are fallacies that exist that warfare can be reduced to science, math, and technology, when in fact it is still and always will be about will and human activity. There are fallacies that we can control the outcome. And Angus, you talked to that. That we can control the outcome of a conflict once it begins. And that we can economize the amount of forces that are required because we think we can predict how much it's going to take from the beginning all the way through to the end. There are beliefs that highly trained, small, professional armies can be rapidly expanded if you need them to be bigger through mobilization or mass recruitment without dissipating the extraordinary effectiveness that comes from professional armies. There are views that the Indo-Asia Pacific region is about waters and navies, not about armies, ignoring the fact that it is always about populations and about where they live and work and have their, doing, their, their meaning. There are views that well-placed special operations forces can be decisive without being connected to conventional and general purpose forces. These are views that, in my opinion, are distorted. They're distortions of reality. And they seek to oversimplify the challenges in such a way that, if believed, would cause one to conclude that armies are no longer needed, or you don't need very much of them. And history says that that, too, is a distortion. So there are challenges also in the way that the region is changing. In emerging China, unpredictable North Korea, aggressive Russia. We see multilateralism rising above the traditions of bilateralism, while still deep chasms of distrust remain to be overcome. There are challenges in the operating environment uh, within which the Australian Army and the U.S. Army and U.S. land forces will work. From the macro, I would say that the tyranny of distance from home to the places where a crisis occurs, that still waits for all of us. The need to balance reduced resources against the need for readiness, modernization, and taking care of our people. The effort of achieving higher effectiveness in joint integration and cross-domain operations. The generating of forces for employment over a sustained period of time, coming up with a sustainable model of force generation and for building readiness. Even achieving higher levels of compatibility and interoperability within a nation's own joint services, as well as among allies and partners who will join in coalition at the time of need. Working collaboratively with partners like the United States to increase the capacity of third countries, like working on professionalism in Papua New Guinea in conjunction with the Australian Defense Forces, or helping to dispel myths, rumors, suspicions, and miscalculations as the U.S.-Australia relationship can be used to help to move us forward in the Japan-China relationship. These are opportunities for us if we're thoughtful. The micro level, within our own formations, preserving that combat edge 
the experiences that Angus Campbell's video showed us that come from operational experience, from doing it for real. When those missions are reduced in number, how do you keep that edge? How do you keep that focus? Keeping our soldiers excited about their service and the experience of soldiering. Finding opportunities for creative uses of land forces. Really, our ultimate challenge is to develop our armies as part of a joint multinational team in order to win in a complex world. And I would say to win in a complex world, Army forces must provide the joint force with multiple options, integrate the efforts of multiple partners, operate across multiple domains, and present our enemies or our adversaries with multiple dilemmas. And we can meet these challenges, and I'm convinced of that. So let me just talk about that just a little bit more. So in an effort to overcome some of these challenges or to confront them, like the challenges of distance, distance from home bases to the areas in the Western Pacific particularly, or in Southeast Asia or in South Asia, as well as overcoming the challenges of reduced resources available to generate ready forces and then to sustain their readiness once achieved, or to finally, uh, finally to demonstrate the military aspects of our strategic rebalance having an effective impact in regional relationships, in the engagements that Rick Berg talked about a few moments ago. In our case, we created a, an operation called Pacific Pathways. That's a title to just simplify what we're talking about. Uh, it is uh, an innovation, a new way of doing some things that we've already been doing. It is also part experimentation as it is creating a laboratory for us to test concepts, test technologies, test methods of tailoring, and it gives us tremendous depth and experience from this. Uh, it was really begun as a way to just get greater leverage from the bilateral and multilateral exercises that we already have ongoing in the region. Because there's a good pattern of exercises out there right now, like the ones that we just uh, talked about, Southern Jackaroo and upcoming Hamel and uh, Talisman Sabre. But also to use that economic efficiency to gain a more enduring presence west of the international date line, increasing the options available then to my boss, the combatant commander of U.S. Pacific Command, initially Sam Locklear and now Harry Harris, while also reassuring allies and partners that we're committed because land forces are the expression of commitment. So Pacific Pathways now, uh, in a very short period of time, has become a very practical application of the ideas that are contained in the U.S. Army's recently published Army Operating Concept, which is titled, Win in a Complex World, especially so in the way that it addresses some of the identified warfighting challenges, and there are a number that, uh, that are highlighted in there. I won't go through all of them. I encourage you to take a look at it uh, for your use. But also the, uh, the way it demonstrates tailoring, adaptiveness, forces operating within a joint and multinational environment. That's an important part of what we do. And we're getting more value than we anticipated. We're getting presence. We're getting combat readiness through true iterations of doing it on the ground, dealing with it in reality, whether that's non-standard live fires that are very complex with joint forces or multinational forces on an area that has populations nearby, as we saw in Indonesia or whether it's uh, working through other complex problems like getting in and out of countries repeatedly, breaking down aircraft and rebuilding them repeatedly, dealing with maintenance at a long string for repair parts supply repeatedly. In other words, we're using reality as the best teacher and what a teacher reality is. There's skill development happening in staffs at multiple echelons, skills that we can't get out of a single exercise no matter how well developed the command post exercise might be. It's dealing with these complex problems of mission command over great distances. It's also thinking ahead to future operations over and over again. And we are now uh, at the point where we are conducting three operations in a given year. The second operation will have as its first stop, Talisman Saber, and then it will proceed on through the region. We've done two previous uh, operations prior to this, and there'll be a third one that happens later this year. 
So we're now resourced to do this three times a year in 16, uh, fiscal year 16 and 17. And then we're budgeted, which is great news, budgeted for three operations a year in the years 18 to 22. A tremendous opportunity for us to look forward to work with the Australian Defense Forces and the Australian Army to uh, better project ourselves to the region and practice some of these things that have been discussed today. And I would tell you, the greatest benefit is our soldiers and our junior leaders are getting development out of this. We can't find any other way. They are excited to be on missions. They are excited to meet other militaries. And they gain a context, an understanding of the region that would be very different even if we were deploying to Iraq or Afghanistan where they meet a single army and have a singularly focused mission. When they go to a different country and touch a different culture and work through a different set of language barriers and equipment barriers, they're learning incredible amounts about what it takes to be effective in operating in this region. Relationships come from that understanding. And so that's what we're seeing out of Pacific Pathways. About three to four months each operation, two or three countries involved in each operation with those existing exercises. Uh, I'll tell you, our training and doctrine command has come to capture some of the lessons learned in this because it is instructive on what the Army is trying to do in journeying toward the year 2020 and 2025 as we also modernize and shape our forces and live in the present on the arguments for why we have to do so. So we're in a pretty good shape. We look forward to working with the Australian Army. Those are just some perspectives of the challenges and also a way to begin to create a forcing function that builds efficiencies, but also that gives you the iterations that you're looking for and being able to answer the things that uh, Assistant Minister Robert talked about this morning. Those go anywhere you're told to go and be ready to do it when you're told to do it. This is what we're all about. So we, uh, again, are pursuing that final outcome of to, being, to be sufficiently sized with a modernized force structure that permits the building of readiness, meeting ongoing mission requirements, responding further to the unforeseen requirements, and having a force that is ready to win in a complex world. So thank you very much for your attention. Aloha, and we will see you in Hawaii or elsewhere around the region. Thank you very much.